I've gotten a lot of requests for the TOK exhibition video, but I have no idea what it is. So I'm gonna go find out, then I'm gonna come back and tell you. Right, so now I've gone through the assessment criteria. I've asked you, hey, teachers. I've watched endless YouTube videos. I've gone on the IB Discord, on the IB subreddit. I've basically done it all, and I'm ready to tell you all about the TOK exhibition. Let's go. Hey there, my name is Emiliano, and I really, really enjoy TOK, especially when I understand it and I get the hang of it. And in this video, I'm not only gonna understand the TOK exhibition myself, but I'm gonna help you understand it and know how you could get top marks, and as well as give you a few examples. Now, while this video might be quite long because of how complex the TOK exhibition is and how in-depth I will go, I will leave timestamps in the description, so make sure that you skip around to the areas that are important. But I do think that you should watch the whole thing because they'll be full of valuable insights and things that you will find useful in the future if you are doing the TOK exhibition. So I'm gonna do a few things. Firstly, I'm gonna define the TOK exhibition and what it is. Then I'm gonna explain how it works. Then I'm gonna explain how you get graded. Then I'm gonna tackle the two approaches that you can have to choosing a prompt and an object. And I'll give examples of both. And then I'm gonna actually choose a prompt and give an example. And I'm gonna actually choose three objects and give an example of that. So what is the TOK exhibition? Well, the TOK exhibition has come to replace the TOK presentation that we M20s and I think up to M21 graduating students did. Now it will be the exhibition that the future generations will be doing. And it is meant to have students learn or realize the connection between very real concrete objects and very abstract prompts and the relation between the two of them. So how does it work? The IB has released a permanent list of 35 prompts that are very abstract. If I had to define them, I would define them as very slippery because they're hard to pin down and it's hard to really know what they mean. You're supposed to connect one of those 35 prompts with three very concrete objects. Now, they have, the objects have to be concrete, they have to be specific, and they have to have a real world context. An example of this could be a mobile phone, but I personally think that while it may have a lot of context, it isn't specific enough. So I would say the 1973 first mobile phone by Motorola, that is a very specific, real world, uh, contextually heavy object. Another example might be a book as a very generic and non-specific object. And the counter example to that could be The Cat in the Hat by Dr. Seuss because my parents used to read to me as a child. Now that is a very context specific and contextually heavy object that is a book while at the same time it is so much more than a book. So what are you graded on? You are graded on the written commentary. You are supposed to write 950 words in total, so that's around 300 per object, on the three objects. Now the way I would structure the commentary is that I would divide it into three main sections. The first one would be the shortest, in my opinion, and it should be the identification of the object and of its specific real world context. The second one should be the link to the IA prompt, the prompt you chose, and you should explain how the object you chose is connected to the IA and why. And then the third, it is the justification of the inclusion of the object in the exhibition. So for example, you should explain the way in which your chosen objects adds to the idea that you're trying to communicate and why the inclusion of this specific object presents a more nuanced or a different or another perspective on your prompt. So this is where you're justifying your inclusion of the objects based on how your objects are illustrating other aspects of the prompt that you haven't covered before. There are two things that you do not need to do during this written commentary. The first thing that you do not have to do is link the TOK objects to one of the TOK themes. So just to make that very clear, it is suggested, but it's not a requirement and it is not graded. The second thing that you do not need to do is link the objects to each other. You can have three very different objects that are not linked to each other in any way 
and that's fine. Now there's two main ways of choosing the first object. There is the top down approach and there is the bottom up approach. Now these two are different and these are just to choose the first object. I'm gonna go through both of these, but take into consideration that further along in the video, I'm gonna go through a very specific method of choosing your first object, regardless of which approach you choose. This is gonna help you choose an approach. And then further along, I'm gonna help you actually choose an object with examples. So the top-down technique has three very simple steps. The first one is choose a prompt of your liking. The second one is focus on choosing one object. Don't think about three objects, don't think about two objects, think about one single object. Once you've got it, go from there. So let me give you two examples. The first one, I looked through the 35 prompts and I chose this one. It says, who owns knowledge? And I started to think and my mind started to wonder. I didn't have any clear ideas and my mind sort of went to patents. Who owns a patent and what does it do? I had heard of the term patent, but I didn't even know what it meant, like technically speaking. So I had my first object, patents. Patents means that the, originally the, the owner of the idea is the person that created it and then it's the government and then it's everybody, right? So that's what a patent more or less does. And I was like, okay, what other examples can I give of things where ownership is tricky. Then I saw, thought of songs. Who owns a song? Is it him? Is it the recording studio? Is it Spotify? Is it Apple Music? Is it me if I download it? If, if, is it me if I have the CD? So that was another, another of my objects. Now I have two objects. And the third one was my school's library. Those were my three objects and it started by choosing the prompt. Now, a second example, uh, again, how I reached this second example is that I read through the 35 prompts. I chose one, what challenges are raised by the dissemination and or communication of knowledge? And my immediate reaction or my immediate thought was Trump's tweets because he used to tweet a lot of fake news and that is a big challenge, the dissemination of false information. So that was my first object. Then I thought about here at home and I was like, okay, so we have one challenge, which is fake news. Another challenge could be access. So I started to think about things where I could demonstrate that there, that there is a challenge in access to education. I thought about rural towns here in Mexico. So I found a news story about the communities that don't have access to the online world. So to the internet, so to speak. And then I thought about access, but not because of geographical circumstances, but because of linguistics. And I went with language barriers in online articles. So if you don't know English, then you might not be able to access a big chunk of the internet. So that's where I went. And I also looked at some news article for that. So that's my two examples on choosing the prompt first, and then the first object, and then going from there, or the top-down approach. Now let's go into the bottom-up technique, or the bottom-up approach has three main steps. You choose one object, you see how it is related to the prompt, to any prompt that it could be related to, and then you choose the other two objects. So it's important here that you choose a object that is more or less related to knowledge and to knowledge production. You can't just say my left shoe, because you're gonna have a really hard time relating that to a knowledge prompt. My first one was a tweet by Anthony Fauci, who is now currently managing the pandemic and the health system in the US. And then how do I relate a tweet by a healthcare professional to a prompt? So I started looking at the 35 prompts and I found this one. What role do experts play in influencing our consumption or acquisition of knowledge? And of course, Fauci is an expert. And so if he tweets something interesting about say herd immunity, then people might say like, okay, this is interesting. I'm gonna research it. That's one way that he as an expert influences it. Another example of this could be the first microscope to ever exist. And the prompt I chose from the 35 was, can your knowledge change established values or beliefs? Because since we didn't know we were made out of cells and then we got the new knowledge of cells through a microscope, well then that really changed our beliefs of what we're made of and what the universe is made of and what living things are made of. So that it will be one object for this prompt. Now let's go through how you can choose a prompt. My advice would be to not read through all of them carefully. Look at the list and skim through it. Don't read every single one, just skim through it a couple of times and see if anything pops up. Immediately 
a few things, concepts will seem very interesting to you. Now choose three to five of these things that seem interesting and that pop up and analyze to what extent you could talk about these fluently, to what extent they seem interesting, to what extent you think you could come up with objects easily of these three to five. Read them carefully so that you are very, very aware of what they're asking and what they mean and then go from there. So for example, so in my case, I read all the prompts, but then I selected these four. How does the way we organize or classify knowledge affect what we know? What are the implications of having or not having knowledge? What is the relationship between personal knowledge and culture? And number four, what role does imagination play in producing knowledge about the world? Now, after that, I ranked these four into the ones I thought were most doable to least doable. And this is more or less what the ranking looked like. Now I'm, I'm, I, I'm gonna, if I was to do this, I would try to work with number one and come up with a few objects and examples. And if I was clearly trying a blank and I had no idea what I was talking about, then I would move on to number two and number three, etc. until I found one that I liked. And that is more or less how you should choose an object and how you should establish the criteria for choosing an object. How to choose an object. Well, it's quite simple, really. There is not a lot to it. If you already know the prompt, and all you have to do is dissect the prompt, look at what it's saying, what it wants to communicate, more or less dissect the terms and go from there. That's quite simple. If you don't know a prompt yet, if you're doing the bottom up approach, then think of an object with a specific real world context. Make sure it is specific and not generic and make sure that there is a context that you can explain. To come up with objects and use your background knowledge, there is only one you. So you're the combination of everything that you've been through and everything that you know and everything that you've read, listened to, consumed, etc. So use that unique combination of ideas to come up with something that you think only you could come up with and make sure to open your eyes to what's around you. So for example, my first example could be the, I was reading this book and it's about cancer. And the first object that came to my mind without a prompt was the Halstead or the radical mastectomy, which is when they remove a breast because of breast cancer. Okay, so I had the first object. It is related to knowledge production. It's not this cup right? This cup has nothing to do with knowledge production. The radical mastectomy does because surgeons were learning from it, etc. And it was completely new and very, very radical. So I have my object looking for a prompt. I analyzed all of them. I read through them one by one and I figured out that the one where it fit the most was what are the implications of having or not having knowledge? Because in this case, they didn't have the knowledge that the radical mastectomy doesn't work. And so they were doing these radical mastectomies and leaving women crippled and it wasn't doing them any good and it was harming them and it was all because they didn't have the knowledge. So that is one implication of not having knowledge in my object. So this was a very, very good prompt that I could work with, no doubt. So another example of how to choose an object without knowing the prompt is that you should think of an object that is related to knowledge in some way. In my case, I chose a 2B pencil, which is the one you use to fill in the scantrons and everything, just because it had to be specific. It could have been the pencil with which I wrote my IV exams, for example, or something along those lines. And then I read through the 35 prompts and I stumbled upon this prompt that I thought was the best. How important are material tools in the production and acquisition of knowledge? And well, that, that, that was great because the pencil is a material tool that is used to produce and acquire knowledge. And then just go from there. And now that you have the prompt, use what I said before to choose an object or to choose more objects. Right, so here comes the long part. I'm gonna give my personal example of what a TUK exhibition guide or outline should look like. I'm gonna use my example on the prompt, who owns knowledge? And I'm just gonna show you what it should look like. So the prompt is obviously who owns knowledge. And my first object is the patent for the global positioning system or GPS. Now my identification of the object in its real world context is that I'm talking about the patent for the GPS and that the patent grants ownership of this invention to the inventor of the product, whatever it is, and that it is given out by the government. 
And that's really important. Who owns it right now, like what it says, and who owns it. And you can read it here, so make sure to pause if you're currently reading. Now my link from the object to the prompt, since the prompt is who owns knowledge, is that it's assumed since the patent is granted by the government, the government is originally the owner of the knowledge of the invention. And then that knowledge is transferred from the government to the inventor for a specific amount of time. And then that knowledge is released from the patent after that amount of time, but it doesn't go back exclusively to the government it becomes public knowledge so while it is it might still be technically owned by the government everybody owns it because everybody has access to it because it will be online etc so here we see that throughout this process knowledge the knowledge in this case the invention is owned by a lot of people the government then the inventor and then the public but it, in the end it is owned by nobody at all because it becomes public knowledge the justification of inclusion what i would say is that i included this example because it shows that knowledge can have ownership at least in legal terms for a short period of time so in this case the amount agreed to by the patent and that after that the knowledge passes on into the public domain where everybody is the owner but that not only can knowledge be owned but that ownership can be transferred at least in legal terms my second object is my middle school's library and my identification of the object and the real world context is that the library while it may be the owner of all the books inside of it since it was in the school it didn't charge us a fee or anything to go inside and read the books so you could go read the books inside the library and steal or take ownership of the knowledge within it. And then my link from the object to the prompt, I'm basically saying that the library was free to use, that you could read inside all the books you wanted, but you couldn't mistreat them, you couldn't take them outside, you couldn't like reprint them. So it is clear that the library is the owner of the knowledge of the books, which are the source of knowledge, but that it disseminates this knowledge freely. It shares it freely. So it's not an exclusive owner because when it shares it, well, it becomes public knowledge as well. And it is the owner of all these books, but you could go inside and read them freely because they would allow it and nobody would call this theft or nobody would say you were stealing knowledge. So I'm here, the link from the prompt to the object is referring to the double ownership or the multiple ownership that knowledge can have. So in this case, well, the owners of the knowledge are the people that wrote the books, followed by the owners of the books, which in this case is the library, but it's not an exclusive owner because us, the students, could freely go in at any time and read as many books as we wanted. So again, this contrasts with the last object because the last object, there was one owner at a time. So that was the government, then the inventor, and then everybody. But here it's the library and everybody at the same time. And that's what they mean when they want, when they say they want you to have a, ob to have objects that draw to different conclusions or different aspects of the same prompt, to illustrate different aspects of the same prompt. And then the third object, I wanted to use a song, but it needed to be specific. So I chose the first song that popped into my head, which was Yummy by Justin Bieber. And the object in its real world context is that this song is a public song that you can listen to on a lot of different streaming services. Um, and it is sung by Justin Bieber. Now the link from the object to the prompt is that one might consider that the person that sings the song is the owner this case Justin Bieber but then you'd be mistaken because it, it's not him so then you think okay if this song is in my Spotify playlist then I'm the owner well that's not true so then it might be Spotify who's the owner but that's not true so then it must be the singer but that's not true there might be a writer and if there isn't a writer then that still might not be true because they usually have labels and labels are the owners of the songs. So it's his label that is the owner of the song Yummy, not him, not me, and not Spotify. And it's this hierarchy of ownership, so to speak, that is what I'm trying to illustrate in this point. And the justification is that just because something is publicly available, doesn't mean it's publicly owned. So while things might be in the public sphere, and we might think that they are publicly owned, they really 
arm. So this is more or less what a TOK exhibition should look like. Take into consideration that I have never done one. I've never actually, actually like done an official one. So this I got from my friends that have done some from teachers, from the IB subreddit, the Discord, the mark scheme, the assessment criteria, etc. But I personally don't have any experience with them. Take that into consideration. So I would really appreciate it if you could like this video, if you could subscribe, and if you could share it with your friends if you found it helpful and if my explanations are good. Because the more people see this, well, the better for everybody. If it's helping them out, it's helping me out. So share this and I'll see you guys next week.